Berkeley senior. So it's my pleasure to welcome Reverend Dr. Ruth Miller to share her message today titled, Change Bringing. It's a word she's coined, and I'm not going to argue with her. So uh, please welcome Reverend Dr. Ruth Miller. Civilization. It's interesting. I was using a video of a quote or a clip of Deepak Chopra yesterday who was saying, Our whole human universe, our whole human civilization is the function of our thoughts. And he said, I don't think we can call it that anymore. We're not exactly civilized. <laughs> Deepak Chopra. <laughs> All right. And historically, not only has every empire done all of that, they've been taken over by another empire. <laughs> you can look at it, just one after another, after another, after another, all the way up through the Roman Empire, which has been extended through the Roman Church, but also was, most of it was taken over by the Muslim empires for a while. And then you know, we had the individual empires growing out of the nations within the Roman Empire, etc., etc. Ah, and now it is the hegemony of the U.S. through our media culture and through our economics and through our military presence all over the world. I was on Veterans Day. I was out and about, and this man got up and he said. We don't just make the U.S. safe, we make everybody safe. And I said thank you and didn't get into it. <laughs> <coughs> the fundamental values of every kind of empire that has ever been formed is acquire as much as you can. Acquire and then accumulate, hold on to that. Build up quantities, hoard. <laughs> Hoarding is really part of our 
cultural values. Isn't that interesting? No wonder it's so hard to break out of it. And ultimately, control. Control ourselves, control the people around us, control the stuff, make sure nobody else gets possible access to our stuff. And control nature because, well, nature is out there, red in tooth and claw, and we have to control it to be safe. Which, thank heaven, for about 50 years, we've been learning otherwise. <sighs> yes. And a huge part of what goes on in every empire is that we throw things away. The tells of the Middle East, the trash heaps, of America. I have a friend who says, the wealth of America is in her sanitary landfills. <laughs> and anyone who's ever looked at what goes into the dump is aware of this. Yes. I e-cycle for the communities that we serve up there around Walport at our little shop. And about every month I have to load up my whole car full of stuff that's been in the garbage, in the garage, in the barn, whatever. The, the, the people don't know what to do with anymore. Old TVs, old tablets, old computer monitors, whatever. We go through, we check to see if we can work with it, and if we can, I take it down to the folks who send it to Eugene, and then they take it apart and hopefully work with it. <laughs> but the other piece of that is not acknowledging that there is anything to learn from the past or anything worth hanging on to. Uh, when Ray and Judy were in Italy a few trips back, <laughs> they went and checked out the village that Ray's family came from. It had been continuously occupied by his family for a thousand years. Can you think of any American that has ever had even close to that experience? I mean, even our native you know, folks are not have not been allowed to unless they're in the pueblos in the next. Wow. A thousand years. And you know what's interesting? They still have trees. They still have fertile land. They have clear water. There is a way to live without destroying our environment. What a strange notion. <clears throat> so I've depicted this process that every empire goes through in this sort of fictitious way, but it isn't because it's based on a computer model. <laughs> but the idea is the population goes down as the death and birth rates go up because all the food and resources is drying up. That's how it works. And the political control systems go down at the same time. So those of us who grew up in a time when the beat cop down the street kept things quiet, or when the justice system seemed to be working, or when our legislative process seemed to be functioning in a way that made sense to us, we have seen over the last 10, 20 years all of that falling. falling. And that's part of this process. It's one of the things that happens. It happened in Greece. It happened in Rome. It happened in a lot of other places. And we're going through it here. We are in the middle of change. This is the output from the computer model, which was the limits to growth model, which was published in 1973 based on data from the 50s. And it was a 100-year cycle, and it ends in 2050. I had a chance to play with that computer program when I was in grad school. It was called Dynamo, and then I later taught it. But when I got to play with it, I did everything. <coughs> we changed the variables. We changed the data. We changed the ways in which things were relating to each other. I could never get it past that fall at about 2040. Couldn't get it past that point. And even when the 90s came along and there was a whole new set of data, there's a book called Beyond the Limits that the folks who were using that computer program were working from. And they were able to push it out a little bit because by the 90s we'd implemented a few things. And all of that was without knowing about, before 73, hardly anything about climate change. 
And the climate change now is one of the big drivers of this structure. But when I was looking at this in grad school, I thought it was about us. But as I looked at it, as I was doing my historical research, I went, oh my goodness, every single time, this is what happens. Every single time. The Gobi Desert used to be the Gobi Forest. And I love, one of my favorite things is the cedars of Lebanon. Has anyone been to Lebanon? Have you ever seen a photograph of Lebanon that had any cedars? Empires use up the resources and desertify the land that they're on. They turn them into deserts. So we are in the middle of this process. We are in what I have recently adopted through some work that I was doing with one of my clients, a liminal state. A liminal state. That is a state where we are neither in one world nor the other. It was developed by an anthropologist who was looking at rites of passage, this idea of a liminal state. You know, when you are on the way into this rite, you're one group. And on the other side of this rite, you'll be in another group. But for now, you're neither. You're nowhere. You're in a liminal state, kind of limbo in a way. You know, it's, it's fuzzy, it doesn't have clear notions and edges and anything else. And if you ever attended one of my seminars where I have this big yellow figure eight thing, infinity, infinity sign, technically it's called panarchy, and the way it works is the seed begins to grow. This grew up in ecology, but is applied to any human system as well. If the seed begins to grow, and as it grows, it starts to accumulate relationships with other beings. And it, you know, those relationships begin to fall apart. And then they start taking on form and more and more and more structure and connection and interconnectivity. And all the time that this is happening, there are all kinds of environmental changes. You know, the wind changes this, weather changes, people come, the people go, animals come and go. So there are these things that are impacting the system this whole time. And then somewhere up here where the structure is so great and it's so interconnected and there is so much bark on the tree, <laughs> a windstorm comes and the whole thing falls apart. Not any particular unusual windstorm. And you all, probably, almost everyone here has dealt with a tree that in that particular windstorm just didn't make it. <laughs> and that's the point at which the system starts to fall into what we like to call chaos. <laughs> chaos. Oh my god, now what? <laughs> how do I deal with this? I don't know how to deal with this, right? <sighs> what I have observed and learned is that going into the chaos is the liminal state. It's not what it was, but it can be something else. And what we have to do is have a vision of what might be to carry us through the chaos to allow the new state to emerge. And so this cycle goes on over and over and over again into infinity. Panarchy, interesting name. All ruling, every aspect in charge. So, where we are is past where that blue line is. <laughs> that blue line is 10 years ago. Wow. The dotted line is 2000. The little dot down there at the bottom next to the blue line, that's where we are. It's all begun to turn downward. We are in that liminal state. What was cannot continue and is not anymore, really. It's only in some people's imagination. So what has happened historically with human beings is that every few thousand years, we come up with another way of living. <laughs> All right? I said that the empire culture started about 4,000 years ago, 4,000 BC, I'm sorry, 6,000 years ago. And it was a combination of things. We know that that was when the Sahara <laughs> rangeland 
once started to be desertified and people started moving into the Fern Crescent, the river valleys. There were environmental pressures on people to move into the river valleys, which put greater numbers of people closer together, so a wide-ranging hunting culture couldn't happen anymore. And they had to find other ways of doing things. They did, and formed the beginnings of what I'm calling empire culture in the process. About a thousand CE, about a thousand years ago, something else began to happen within the falling apart of the Roman Empire and the continuing battle between the Roman Church and the Muslims and other forms of expressing divinity. And one of those things was most beautifully exemplified in the Cistercian monks. The Cistercian monks were operating under the rule of Saint Benedict, which says that a few people come together, whoever they were before they became part of this monastery, they are no longer. So they are all equal as brothers in the monastery, number one. Number two, the Cistercians understood that each monastery had to support themselves. And St. Benedict's rule said you spend four hours a day in the work that supports the monastery, four hours a day in work that is spiritual work, and then the rest is in silence in working on your own personal spiritual work. Well, the Cistercians figured out that they could acquire unused, unloved land and begin to turn it into a thriving way of being. So they would talk to a baron or a king because in the empire model, the guy in charge owns it all. And they'd have to talk to the guy in charge and say, can you let us use, please, 50 acres, that ugly 50 acres over there on that hill slope that has a little stream running through the bottom. And invariably, they would get a yes. And so nine monks would walk out there, go out there in their white robes. They were the white brothers. And they would bring a few sheep with them. And they would build a place to live. And then they would expand on that place to live as the sheep began to have wool. They created a wool carding and cleaning space. As the sheep's wool was carded and cleaned, it, cleaned in sufficient quantity, they created the spinning part of the space for spinning. And as the herd of sheep grew, they would invite people from the larger community to come in and help them take care of the sheep and help them carve the wool, etc. So over about a 10-year period, these nine months would typically be about 40 or 50 months with about 3,000 people observing and participating in what they're doing on a piece of land that the baron thought was no use at all for the king. So they were basically building an assembly line. And they were using water to power what they were doing. The power from the stream would manage their carding mills and their weaving mills, etc. So they were doing in 1000 BC, 1000 AD, 1000 years ago, they were creating a machine. And there's a wonderful book called The Medieval Machine that talks about that. But more than that, remember everybody in the monastery is equal regardless of who they were. And everyone can read and write because that's part of it. And everyone has a voice. Well, each monastery, although they were part of an order that had the bishop and the pope to tell them what they could do spiritually, elected their own abbot to manage the monastery fiscally and administratively. Everyone is equal, and we elect our leader a thousand years ago. The Cistercians were also, or St. Benedict and St. Bernard, both of whom affected the Cistercians, were also helping the Templars form during that same period. These guys who wore white with a red cross. A red cross on a white banner. None of us have ever seen that, have we? <laughs> Out of Geneva, Switzerland, starting about 1400 AD CE, after 
all of the Templars were wiped out in France, quote unquote. We won't get into that, but something to consider. So this idea of everyone is equal, we elect our leaders, was made available to all of these people that were working with the Cistercians and the 50,000 people who were working with the Templars. That's what it took to sustain 150 nights. <laughs> yeah. And then all of the folks who were involved in other St. Benedict's monasteries. That, to me, is the beginning of what became the Democratic Republic. Many people are convinced that what we call Freemasons today were once the monks in these orders, whether they were Knights of Templar or any of the others. And if they weren't actually the monks, they were related to them and were familiar with these ideas. And virtually everyone that put together the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were Freemasons. <coughs> and they were all equal in Freemasonry and they elected their leaders. So we get the emergence of a new form of governmental structure, which we call the Democratic Republic. And that's what the orange line is. But the Democratic Republic kept the empire values. It was so woven into the fabric of life that the guys didn't even realize they were living that. And they continued to build empire, even though it was in the form of a Democratic Republic. We had manifest destiny, right? It was our destiny to take over the world. <laughs> Okay, well, we managed to exceed the carrying capacity of the planet in the process, and that's what that dotted line shows. But, along about 2000, right about now, a new thing began to emerge. And this is the seed for the panarchy. This is what will get us through the possibilities and the upsets that we are dealing with right now. I'm saying 2000 because, well, 1965 is real close to 2000 <laughs> in the cycle of history. And if we look at 1965, it wasn't just the Beatles. <laughs> there was a lot more going on then, among other things. The Unitarians and the Universalists got together and they put together a set of principles that we live with today and we hope to live with forever, frankly. And that set of principles represented a way of thinking that was emerging at that time. And I won't go into them right here and now, but you can think of them, you know, that we support the democratic process. We honor the inherent right to dignity, right? Dignity for every individual. We accept one another. Almost all of those were present in the monasteries for the last thousand years. And they've been pulled out into us normal lay people culture. So we have the beginning of a new way of living and thinking about things. And by 1985, when we adopted the seventh principle, the interconnected way of life, ecology, ecosystem, systems thinking was emerging everywhere in the culture. And by 85, the field, the programs that had been put together in the early 60s through the early 70s were almost redundant because, almost in systems and cybernetics, because you had systems in management systems and psychology systems and education systems. You know, almost everybody else was teaching systems. So systems thinking and the fundamental principles of the Unitarian Universalists and ecology emerged in the 60s through 80s in a way that, for me, was the seed of a new culture. So we can see it in this way. This emerging culture that we are part of the beginning of, that we are the seeds for, is based on Unitarian principles almost completely. 
Uh, one of the things that I did when I was uh, trying to understand the values of empire culture is I started comparing them to the values of the indigenous cultures that I saw in various writings along the way. My undergraduate work was in anthropology, so I knew how to go find that stuff. And as I looked at ethnographies and as I listened to people who had actually lived among various indigenous peoples, this wouldn't be a bad summary of indigenous people's values. Isn't that interesting? So what we're likely to be experiencing over the next 25, 30 years, as what we grew up in continues to dissolve around us, is a way of living that is far more like what the people who lived here before us were living like, but with significant differences. And I'm not entirely sure how much high tech we're going to be able to hang on to, but I know that Elon Musk's Starlink is up there so that we don't have to have towers and still can be connected. Isn't that interesting? And I know other things are being put in place for various reasons that are helping us make the shift. And so I'm quite hopeful that even though the culture I grew up in and the culture I was taught was civilized, cannot continue. What is emerging is going to be so much more wonderful and sustainable for generations to come. 75 years is what our culture tends to, historically over about a thousand years, take to take from one idea that's very weird, not possible, no way, to everybody's knowing it, of course it's normal. Right. 1965 to 2040, 75 years. I'm looking forward to the next 20 years. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> so, as we go through the breakthrough, which we will have, we must have, we will see everyone adapting to environmental unpredictability. They will build houses that can be quite comfortable in whatever happens, right? And grow food in a way that is not dependent on the kind of weather cycles that were an absolute freak between 1955 and 1965. My mother was a geologist and geographer, I'm sorry, and she would go, people don't understand. <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> And we're going to see more and more local government having more and more to say about what is going on and less and less being driven by the federal or international government relationships. And we're going to have more and more households be essentially self-sufficient, but not in the way of you know, dirt farmers from the 20s, right? We're not talking about that not from 100 years ago. We're talking about a way of living that, as with St. Benedict's rule, takes about four hours a day to take care of all of your food, clothing, housing needs. Wow. That would feel really good. It should be 72 hours a week. <laughs> right? And then limited access to high tech. Now, in my book, Home, I describe all of this in great detail because I think it's important that we have a vision for where we can be going, for where we are acting, the direction we're acting in to make happen. And I know a lot of you are, and that's very cool. Off-worlders, well, you know, they're still trying to get that rocket fired. <laughs> but the idea, and there are companies that are all set up for this, the idea is that we will have more and more folks living off the planet <coughs> And they will be creating off-planet, using things like 3D printers, their resources from the resources that are out there. Their technology will grow from the resources out there. They're not going to be bringing stuff back to the planet. Anyone tells you that? It costs too much. <coughs> I mean, if we think it costs a lot to get from here to someplace on the planet, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, every moon mission is an F-37 bomber for what that's worth. All right, so they will be functioning, but they will be functioning without us. We won't be doing very much interaction with them in this early stage. Beyond that, all kinds of possibilities are there. But the fundamental thing is we are a very adaptive species. 
and we can create when we are clear from the inside what it is that we intend to be and do. We can create exactly what will fulfill us individually and support the generations to come. And I want to thank you all for being Unitarian Universalists and working with these principles because you are making it happen. Thank you. long, slow, deep breaths to relax in this body, in this chair, in this time. Recognizing that what once defined who and what we are and can be is slipping away and yet we are safe and secure. Life is good. So we just relax into this moment of beingness. And we know that surrounding us and guiding us is an awareness of what's possible. That we are being called into step by step, decision by decision, as we allow ourselves to know that people all over the world are shifting into this new way of being, and we're a part of that. So we breathe with them. We give thanks for them and for the awareness that we have now as we allow ourselves to simply be this new world coming into form. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Jeff, again for tickling with the ivories. <laughs> and it relaxes everybody. I really appreciate that. <sighs> so, we've come to a part of our program 
our Sunday service where we talk about our, our community partners and our obligations to our fellowship, and our obligation to our community partner. Uh, for this month and next month, our community partner that we are supporting financially and maybe you with some blood, sweat, and tears is uh, Saisa Outreach Services. SOS supports and transforms the lives of those in crisis through homelessness prevention, sexual assault, and supportive domestic violence services. Tuvia, would you like to share anything more about that? Uh, Tuvia is our outreach coordinator, and he probably got something to say about SOS. Just in that, very briefly. Right here, microphone. This is all connected. Supporting ourselves, our community, to live a better life, a protected life, a good life. And SOS is there to do what needs to be done for those who need that help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. So your contribution to SOS can be placed in our basket. We have got a basket that serves two purposes. SOS, as you can see very nicely, and Florence Unitarian Universalist Fellowship on that side. There are some envelopes and receipts in the middle if you'd like to take that uh, as well. So, um, yeah, so as we begin this, Catherine, will you help on this side? And Julie, will you help on this side? Thank you. As we begin, I ask that you repeat after me. Divine love through me. Divine love through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. All that I give. All that I give. And all that I receive. And all that I receive. I am prosperous now. I am prosperous now. And less it be. So as the basket is being passed among you, if you are unable to contribute to one or both or either, that's fine. Just pass the basket to the next person and bless it with your love as it goes its way. And for those listening, thank you. And for those listening at home, if you'd like to make a contribution, you can mail us a check to P.O. Box 2502, Florence 97439, or anyone can go onto our website and click the donate button and it will take you to either PayPal or your preferred credit card. So while the basket is being passed, this is a time to do some announcements. I'm going to start by just saying, you know, again, I reiterate, we operate here based on volunteers. So people that have been coming here for a while, we're going to rely on you to come help us. We need help on Sunday mornings to come about 9.30 and meet people, make sure that things are taken care of. We need folks to help maybe bring some refreshments. So now is your time to look at this little clipboard. It's going to be in the cafe. I'm not going to pass it around. Just sign up. I'll send a reminder to you so you'll be prepared. Okay? It's harmless. Right, Lydia? Where'd Lydia go? Oh, she left. It was so bad. Um, it's really harmless work. So if you come at 9.30, there'll be a few things to do, and uh, we'll walk you through it. Membership, refreshments, and youth fellowship. As well, Tumia tells me we're looking for some folks to join our unchoir. So if you've got a special voice and you want it to be heard, join the unchoir. So um, in the program, you're going to see we've got all kinds of things listed. You can read those at your leisure, but the one thing I want you to know is on December 4th, we're going to be doing a tree trimming party. So I think we've got decorations here, but when the service is over, we invite everybody to come take the decorations and decorate our tree. It's a holiday tree. We're Unitarian Universalists, so bring what you have to celebrate the holiday, whatever that means to you. We may ask that folks maybe bring some sweets. Um, we may set that up in the cafe and, you know, get a bag and take some sweets home with you. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing to do. You'll have more information on that later. But anyway, um, so yeah, next week we've got uh, Reverend Donna Smith here on her talk, and then she's going to do another of her Raising Consciousness classes. And we've got Thanksgiving and all the other stuff. So that's that stuff. Is there, are there any other announcements? Yes, Brooke, please come forward. Yesterday evening when I was vacuuming, I found a hearing aid. I wondered if it was, yeah. yeah you thought it was I thought it was here. <laughs> you. Hi all. Um, my name is Anna Miller, and I'm planning an event with Save Slow Vision and Save Slow Family Connection, where we're going to be um, basically reserving the event center and having an opportunity for families to come together where child care is provided and just talk about some of the issues and you know, ideas and ideas. Um, in the communities, and one of the things that we really need for the each table is to have someone who's willing to sit 
and listen and take some notes and help guide the conversation in a way that's productive. And so we're really looking for people who might be interested in participating, and it, it's just a great opportunity. So um, you have a date in mind? Okay. It'll be January 6th from 4 to 8 p.m. is when we can do it. So you probably have about 10 tables, so you need 10 volunteers. 15. 15. 15. <laughs> Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And if you know any local organizations, like of course we'll be reaching out to SOS, um, but if you if you know of any organizations that you think would want to be uh, participating, we'll be reaching out as well. But, um, Reach out to the city council. Oh yeah, you'll, you'll be here. Thank us. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So just so you know, we uh, there's a group in town, we are coming together to talk about the serious issue of child care. So that will be one thing that we will be talking about. Hey, Fred, come on. Hey. Woo -hoo -hoo. Fred's back. Fred's back. Fred's back. I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, our Zen meditation practice will be starting this Tuesday. Yay. And um, we will, if you're new to the practice and would like some instruction in Zen meditation, uh, I'll be here 30 minutes beforehand. Our meditation starts at 2. So if you want to come a little bit early and get a little bit of instruction as to what we do next, um, I'll be happy to walk you through it. Thank you. And now that his uh, meditation class is officially on the calendar, it will be on the program as well going forward. And uh, with contact information, uh, a flyer coming out as well. Any other announcements? Yes. Yes. Um, <coughs> for the months of November and December, yes. the game night will be canceled. Oh, well then I'll take it off the calendar. Because of the holidays. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. We'll go back in action on the last Saturday of uh, January. January. Got it. I'll remove it from the calendar. Thank you. Wow. Okay, well, look at this. Thank you very, very much. Um, you know, we thank you for your spiritual practice of giving and, uh, and loving. Your contributions are received in grateful appreciation. Would you like to come forward, Brooke, and extinguish the chalice? Since Stanley beat you to the lighting, I'll let you do the extinguishing. <laughs> and if you want to get the kiddos to come on back in, that'd be great. Perfect. So this is a... Um, and extinguishing, I just love this one, Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, and our care for each other. Our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, and be loving. You may now take your phones out, take it off of airplane mode, because uh, we're complete for another fabulous Sunday. Please join Ruth Miller in the library later. She also has books on the back table if you'd like to see what she has. She's got some great books. So she'll be waiting for you in the library in 15, 20 minutes. And uh, we ask that you rise, form a big circle around the space. We're going to sing the peace song. We're going to hold hands as you feel you can, or lock arms. And uh, we're going to sing our peace song. So let's get those kiddos in and let's uh, tighten up the circle. Be careful around the camera. And remember, we've got refreshments and fellowship in the cafe, as well as the sign-up sheet to help do us uh, proud later, okay? You ready, Jeff?
chorus, right? Yes. Do you need a chorus? Choir or chorus?